Anyway, I think I can say good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Cortland County, uh, we welcome you to this educational forum on death with dignity. This is one of many Making Democracy Work events that our Cortland League sponsors. Uh, I want to first thank the Cortland Community Center for hosting the forum. This is our first time in this wonderful venue uh, with the sound system and the projector. Uh, this is just great. Dick, thank you very much, and to all the volunteers who support the center. I uh, also want to thank Sharon Stevens for videotaping the forum. Oh, and we ask you all to silence cell phones. That means me too. Uh, and. Uh, would appreciate your not recording video. So we have uh, three panelists today. Uh, I will just briefly uh, introduce each. Uh, Corinne Carey is an attorney with Compassion and Choices. She's sitting in the middle. Uh, she's the New York State Campaign Director <clears throat> with Compassion and Choices. Uh, she came to that organization a couple years ago after nearly a decade with the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, there she engaged in advocacy on a wide range of civil liberties issues, uh, which included public health and medical privacy, which are relevant to today's discussion. Uh, on your right, Erin uh, Beyer, serves as Systems Advocacy and Architectural Barrier Programs Coordination for Access to Independence here in Portland County. Erin coordinates ATI Statewide Systems Advocacy Network, as well as local systems advocacy initiatives, including those relating to transportation and housing. Then on your left, Deborah DiBartolo is a family nurse practitioner uh, medical Director of Cortland and Ithaca Urgent Care and a clinical nurse educated at Tompkins Cortland Community College where she has an adjunct faculty appointment. She has expertise in forensic and emergency nursing, sexual assault, and substance abuse. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome all three of our uh, panelists. So this is our agenda today. Uh, we'll start by uh, my providing background. On, I'm Allison King, president of the Cortland League of Women Voters. I'll provide background on why the Cortland League is considering this issue. Uh, and some background in addition on what is death with dignity or medical aid and dying, what are the laws in other states, and, and what's current law in New York, uh, as well as proposed legislation in New York State. The next section will be, to my mind, uh, maybe the most important thing we cover today, which is what are the resources available in New York State for advanced planning? What can each of us do with our friends, with our family, with ourselves, to make sure that, that we are prepared and the, the people um, whom we know and love are prepared to uh, make decisions uh, as we uh, confront some challenging health uh, issues. And um, Deb DiBartolo will be covering that section. Then the last portion of the program will be a discussion of the New York State League's proposal, perspectives from our panelists, as well as their response to questions from the audience. So to begin with, the process for decision making in the League of Women Voters is a consensus process. So every two years, the New York State League at our uh, national convention, which happened in June of 2017, we consider uh, the past program, we consider new programs issues. And during the June 2017 uh, annual convention, 
one of the uh, proposals that was voted on by the delegates, I was a delegate from the Portland League, we voted on a proposal, uh, uh, one league had recommended that New York State adopt the Utah League's position on death with dignity. So at the convention, the state uh, local leagues endorsed that we should consider this. And now the process, the consensus process, goes out to the <coughs> leagues. Each local league votes, and those votes will then become New York State policy, which will guide whether <coughs> New York advocates on this issue. So the, the, um, at convention, our, our New York State delegates modify the Utah position a little bit. So you see it up here, and for those that may be a little bit small, um, the proposed position that we, the League members, will be voting on is one. The League of Women Voters of New York believes state laws should grant the option for a terminally ill person to request medical assistance from a relevant licensed physician to end one's life. And two, the League of Women Voters believes such legislation should include safeguards against abuse of the dying and protections for medical personnel who act in good faith compliance with the law. So our league decided to first hold an educational forum so we learn about both sides of this issue and then we will vote at our board meeting on February 5th. Uh, at the end of the forum, I'll also provide options for league members of uh, different ways that you'll be able to vote. So, next question, next section is, is background. What is medical aid in dying? So it's a medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable person who has a prognosis of six months or less to live has the option to request from their doctor a prescription for medication which he or she can choose to self-ingest to end unnecessary suffering and hasten death. This medical practice is also known as death with dignity. And again, the League of Women Voters of New York State has no position on this topic at present. So what's happened in other <coughs> states? What are, what are laws in the US? Uh, Oregon was the first state to enact a law. This was in 1994. Uh, and it authorized medical aid and dying, the Death with Dignity Act. It went into effect in 1997 uh, after unsuccessful legal challenges by the U.S. Attorney General. So it's been an, in effect for about 20 years. There are six states, as well as Washington, D.C., where similar laws have been passed through a variety of methods. Uh, through referendum, uh, court action, uh, and legislative action. And, and most of these were fairly recent, 2008 to 2016. In New York, and let me provide the caveat, I'm not an attorney, I'm not giving any legal opinions here, so uh, just a broad overview, New York State law prohibits assisted suicide and euthanasia. So a person who assists a suicide will be guilty of manslaughter in the second degree unless the suicide is caused by duress or deception, in which case a defendant could be found guilty of second degree murder. The proposed legislation in New York, New York's Medical Aid and Dying Act, was introduced in January 2017, sponsored by Senator Diane Sabino and Assembly Member Amy Pollan. The Assembly Health Committee uh, did pass an earlier version of this law out of committee in May 2016. Under this proposed Medical Aid and Dying Act, a terminally ill, mentally capable adult that is 18 years or older can request life-ending medication from a doctor 
that the person can take at a time of his or her choosing, or never, to bring about death, so long as he or she can self-administer it. And terminal illness is defined as an illness that will, within reasonable medical judgment, result in death within six months, whether or not treatment is provided. Self-administration is a critical part of this. No health professional can administer the medication. No family member or friend. The person must self-administer. Thinking about the League's proposed position on this, safeguards were an important part of it. Uh, so these are some of the safeguards that are in the proposed act. Uh, one is that it, the terminal nature of the illness must be confirmed by two doctors, and neither age nor disability is considered terminal. Uh, if a doctor believes the patient lacks the capacity for informed consent, that doctor must refer the patient for a mental evaluation and there must be a written report by a mental health professional. The individuals, the terminal patients, uh, request for the medication must be voluntary and it must be both verbal, oral, and written. And two witnesses um, must, there, there must be two witnesses to that written request and uh, only one of those is allowed to be a um, relation, a family member, or someone who could benefit from the will. Uh, neither of the two witnesses may be the doctors, those two doctors, or the mental health professional uh, involved in, in the evaluation of the patient. A very important part of the proposed legislation is that the person must be counseled on uh, options that are available. Uh, for, this includes pain management, hospice, palliative care, uh, because often people are suffering needlessly uh, and part of, part of why we're here today is so that we're, we all are educated about what resources are available to us. Uh, another set of protections regarding the medication itself, any unused medication must be disposed according to health department protocols. The cause of death, recall this is a terminally ill patient, so a patient who has an illness that is thought and is thought to be dying from this illness. So the cause of death would be that underlying illness or disease. Uh, and thus insurance companies could not uh, deny an annuity or life insurance policy if someone did take it, if this were enacted and someone took advantage of, of um, this choice or chose, chose to take the medication. Uh, healthcare professionals would have immunity from civil and criminal penalties uh, and from malpractice for good faith action or for a refusal to act. No health professional would be required to uh, participate in, in this process. There also would be penalties for fraud or coercion. There would be civil or criminal liability for negligence, um, for intentional misconduct, and for recklessness. Uh, anyone who alters, destroys, conceals, or forges a person's request would commit a felony. So that's a brief overview of proposed legislation in New York. And now we will hear about what resources are available to, to all of us. Okay, thank you. Here, where I can hit the buttons here. Yeah, if you want me to, yeah, I'm going up and down. Uh, 
If you have a chance, um, and this topic really interests you, on the uh, web, if you Google search this, there's a lot of excellent resources with actually both sides of the argument and both sides of the thought process. Um, nicely laid out, um, the New York State Resource for Advanced Planning um, is an excellent resource also for you to, um, to peruse, and, and I think you'll find, you'll find some good information there. The three things that we deal with the most for advanced planning in the hospital, though, are living wills, uh, the healthcare proxy designation, um, the DNR order, um, the most form, which we're going to talk about today, which are um, important tools um, so that way you have control over the end of your life. Our life is expected to end, and, and that's part of our living. And to pretend that it doesn't is a denial of a normal process of, of a being a human being. And the goal, in my opinion at least, is for us to have control over that, just like we have control over the other parts of our life. So that's what I'm hoping to help you guys find in here. So the living will is really a piece of paper that um, you can fill out that gives your next of kin, the person who's going to be making decisions for you, information about what you want to have happen at the end of your life. Your healthcare proxy designee is the person that you want to choose to make those decisions for you if you're unable to make them for yourself. And particularly important if they're not actually your legal next of kin. So if you want your health care designee to be somebody besides your legal next to kin, it's important that that is there for you. And then your do not resuscitate order um, is important for you to make a decision about and have signed if you don't want to be um, resuscitated in the event of a cardiac arrest. This is one place where we find things get a little sticky in the hospital because some just because somebody has a DNR order might mean they don't want to be they still might want to be treated they still might want to have aggressive medical treatment they still might want to have trial ventilation they still might want to have an elective cardioversion if they have a um, an event that could be fixed with cardioversion and it's important and that's where your most form is going to come in and we're going to talk about in a minute that we separate these things out so that way you do have that control over what happens at the end of your life. So we're, as healthcare providers, providing our patient that's in front of us the, um, the care that, that they want. So this is um, an example of a living will. And it just talks about and has some ideas about things you may or may want, not want to have toward the end of your life. You may or may not want to use antibiotics. You may or may not want to have a feeding tube. You may or may not want to have a trial intubation where you're on a ventilator and we're helping breathe for you. You may or may not want hydration, IV hydration. You may or may not want um, oh, other cardiac medications. You may want maximal amount of pain management. You may want maximum amount of anxiety management. You may want maximum amount of comfort provided. So that's a place to have this discussion here. And you'll see that this gives the options toward the center of the first page where it says do or do not want antibiotics, hydration, nutrition. Because without that guidance, um, there have been times in, in the recent past, and, and we're getting to get away from it now because we're talking more about death and dying and dying um, with respect and dignity, where everybody got an NG tube, everybody got um, IV hydration. And that might not be the way you want to go for the end of, end of your life. And what's an NG tube? A nasogastric tube where we put the tube down the nose and are able to put food directly into your stomach. So if you're on a ventilator, if you have a tube in your throat breathing for you, you obviously can't take oral food at that point. We can put a tube in your nose and then put the, like, Ensure or those, um, drink type products directly into your stomach for hydration and nutrition. Right for some people, not right for others, but most important, you gotta find the one that's right for you. Your healthcare proxy is the person that you choose to make these decisions for you. Um, I, without a healthcare proxy, um, it goes down your legal next to kin list, so particularly if you want somebody else to make that decision. In my family, um, Honestly, I'm everybody's healthcare proxy. <laughs> um, and so we, we, they intentionally wanted to go around that. 
but for a lot of reasons. Um, um, and when my gram was um, dying, my mom didn't feel that she'd be strong enough, and my gram didn't feel that my mom would be strong enough to be able to make those decisions, so she bypassed her. My mom now feels that my brothers and sisters might not be strong enough to, and medically not, uh, aware enough to make those decisions, so I was chosen. So think about that. It might not be your legal next person. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I would not equate healthcare proxy with durable power of attorney. Agreed. They're really not the same thing. The power of attorney goes much further. Agreed. Financial stuff. Okay, that's, I just want yes. people to understand that's yes. also called should not be healthcare. Agreed. Agreed. Um, the, the comment, in case it wasn't caught by the um, video and audio, was that healthcare proxy is not the same as durable power of attorney, but please note on the slide that it's healthcare durable power of attorney, not broad power of attorney, but only for healthcare decisions. Thank you for the clarification. And then your DNR order. Some people um, take this as do not resuscitate, do not want CPR. Some people identify this as do not want CPR and do not want to be put on a ventilator. Some people take this as do not want CPR, do not want, do not want electrical shock, do not want to be put on a ventilator. And other people I've taken care of have said, I don't want CPR, but please put me on a ventilator. So important to have these discussions with your provider and the people you care about because First of all, we want to do what you want to have done, but second of all, based on what your medical condition is, that may or may not solve any problem for you or be pertinent to, to your wellness or what you're trying to get out of this. So we're trying to continue to, um, these conversations with your healthcare provider so that way you are understanding what you're getting out of this and what we're giving to you and being sure that we're on the same page with what those two things are. Because sometimes I find they're actually different. <coughs> The most form, um, if everybody doesn't have one, there's one on the back there, and this is be your moment to get that work on getting that filled out. The pink and one. The, it's the bright pink form back there. And um, this talks about, it combines to some degree all these things. It um, can be used if you have it out of the hospital. It's good for the first 48 hours when you're in the hospital until a doctor has a chance to extend your DNR when you're hospitalized, so we can follow your requests at home. It's a place to talk about whether you, what kind of comfort measures that you want, what kind of medical interventions that you want, who do you want to assist you with these, what do you want limited. Again, it brings back to the intubation and do you want to be on that ventilator or don't you want to be on the ventilator or do you want to have a trial ventilation or don't you want to have a trial ventilation. And do you want um, the nutrition in forms of down your nose, in your arm, or um, IV fluids. So it's important to talk through and to talk through with your family and your trusted healthcare person so that way you understand what you're getting out of this, what you have to not get out of this, and that your family knows and understands why you're doing this so that way they're not stressed out and worried about it. One thing that happened in my family when my grandma was pantsing is my um, uncles wanted to have IV fluid hydration because they didn't want her to um, get dehydrated and they didn't understand that. So um, it, it took some family discussion about why we might not want to rehydrate grandma in her last few days because there's that natural ketosis that happens, it's a natural comforting, and why this might just extend her suffering. So those very specific things are important to talk to your healthcare provider about because what you think you may know or understand um, might not actually be the case. And my uncle's very smart man, just don't know about healthcare, um, really felt that they were advocating for what they thought was the right thing for my gram, but didn't understand. So we needed to have those conversations. So I want, my role, I think, as a nurse practitioner is to be sure those conversations happen. Not to make a decision for somebody, but to be sure that you have the opportunity to make, have all that information with your family. I guess the one thing, if I could just add some commentary for myself, is I would like to see this extended past physicians and into nurse practitioners, as nurse practitioners are taking a greater role in our healthcare, and have that opportunity many times to spend that extra time with somebody um, that a physician might not be able to. And we're spending, we're doing a lot of palliative care and a lot in hospice, and um, I'd like to see that extend out, obviously, to, to include the role of the nurse practitioner, because that's really what our, what our job is and what we're trained to do. 
just some more information about the moles, and, and I'll certainly be glad to talk to people individually about this, but um, again, in here we're talking about rehydration, about um, hospital transfers. Some folks who are in um, assisted living might wish to stay in their assisted living environment and not be transferred to the hospital. They want to stay where they're comfortable, and this is, allows them to do that. I've worked with some assisted living facilities that if an elder falls, they have to be transferred to the hospital. That's just their rule because they want to be sure they don't have a broken hip or an injured head. Some folks don't want to do that. Some folks want to stay in their bed where they're comfortable. And this allows you to have that discussion and make those decisions for yourself. I think that's the end of it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and just to follow up on the comment, um, I'm my mother's durable power of attorney, but my brother's a doc. So he's the health care resource, and we're part of the team that tries to figure things out. Uh, I went to a program on end-of-life resources down in Florida, and for those of us who have family in different states, it is important to understand in Florida the do not resuscitate order, they have a special form that gets posted on the fridge in case there's an emergency, you need to have that form posted. Uh, also, uh, in speaking with one of our committee members, she was saying that these forms really have to be with you if you're hospitalized so that people are aware uh, of your wishes. Um, I also found it helpful that there are specific addendums to a living will that can discuss um, someone who, say, develops Alzheimer's disease and can no longer recognize family. I actually signed one of those when my mother uh, did the same. I felt like that was something that was important to me and I wanted my, my family to be aware of my wishes on that. Can I just say both of the local hospitals, both Portland, both Portland Regional and Cuba Medical Center, if you have a healthcare proxy, we'll keep that, or most, we'll keep that um, photocopied in your electronic record. So while it's important to have it on you and maybe even have it with a family member, it will be in your medical record there. So double check if you want it there, double check with your hospital and your healthcare provider to be sure that your most form, if you have one, is in your medical record there. So should you come in in an emergent state, um, when we pull up your medical record to look to see what's been going on with you to understand your health history, we can see your most form there and we can um, can continue on with what your wishes are if you aren't able to share that information with us. Okay, so now we will um, ask our speakers to respond to the proposed uh, position of the state league. It's, it's up there. Um, I won't read it again unless people uh, would, would like it repeated. Uh, we'll start with Corinne, and you just turn the mic on there. And uh, we'll ask Corinne and Erin to speak, and then if Deb has any additional comments, uh, it will be her turn, and then questions from the audience. Great. Thank you, Allison, for um, creating this opportunity to have such an important discussion, and thanks to all of you for coming out to participate. Um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks short so that we can have some conversation. Um, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about Compassion and Choices. My organization is a national nonprofit. Um, our vision is a society where people receive state-of-the-art care and a full range of choices for dying in comfort, dignity, and control. We aim to ensure that people understand the risks and rewards of all feasible treatment options and that, there, that all of the decisions that a person makes are fully respected and that care reflects a person's values and priorities in this really important final chapter of our lives. I think the best way to understand this issue is through real life experiences. Um, Allison uh, described the legislation really carefully and um, on your way out you can get a flyer in the back that has a summary of the bill uh, and some more information. But, but I want to talk to you about the choices that, that real people here in New York face and I was trying to figure out what uh, what stories to share with you. I've been, since I took this job two and a half years ago, I've been traveling 
all over the state, from the North Country to Long Island, from Buffalo to Brooklyn, and everywhere in between. And I've talked to hundreds of people who've lost loved ones in unnecessarily painful ways. I've talked to people who are dying, uh, who, want, who want these choices. Um, so I thought, should I tell you the story about the transgender man in New York City who uh, was a hospice volunteer during the AIDS epidemic um, and wanted uh, some control over his own death. Uh, and unfortunately, though, a fan and a volunteer of hospice um, died in tremendous pain in a leading medical institution right in the middle of New York City. Or should I tell you about the African-American woman who we met at the state fair who came up to me with tears in her eyes to tell me about her 30-year-old daughter who died of cancer just four months before and begged her for help and that she still feels guilty to this day that she couldn't do anything to help her daughter pass away peacefully. Or the man on Long Island who opened a meeting with a legislator just a few months ago saying, my mother asked me to shoot her. Or the 9-11 first responder, Douglas Greenwood, who shot himself at the entrance of a public park in Long Island just before Christmas uh, because he couldn't bear the suffering of sleeping with an oxygen tank for 10 years and just seeing his health deteriorate um, to a death that he knew was coming. But instead of telling you those stories, <laughs> I'll tell you about my friend from Buffalo. Um, I just came from Buffalo a few weeks ago, and the woman that I went to graduate school with at the University of Buffalo, um, she was our real estate lawyer when my husband and I bought our house there. Um, she took me under her wing. She was a few years older than I was in graduate school. And she really is the center of a progressive community in Buffalo. She's always had uh, her agenda. She's always had her, you know, her court cases under control. And when she was diagnosed with anal cancer last year, the first thing she did was ask her doctor, how can I beat this? And so she's gone through quite a few aggressive treatments, um, some experimental treatments, in fact. She's, all, she's, she's my age, she's, uh, she's 50 years old. And she's still fighting. Um, she's gonna continue fighting for as long as she can. She completed all of her advanced directives and she knows what she wants, she's talked to her friends. But she said to her doctor at Roswell Park, you know, what's next? If all of this fails, when my treatment options run out, what is available to me? Now, it's my job to talk about death and dying every day. I'm literally the life of the party when I, when I go places. Um, but it's really hard to talk to a friend about her death and her dying process. She invited me to come out and talk to a group of her community in Buffalo, and so I put together a presentation about what options are available to her when all else has failed. Uh, and I thought it might be helpful to share that with you so that you have some understanding of why uh, this proposal is before the legislature. So there are five options available to people who are dying in New York. And the first is, um, you know, obviously all available medical treatments and interventions. One can fight until the end. And that's what my dad did. My family is Catholic. My dad was a Marine. He wanted to fight until the very end. He didn't even want pain medication. Um, and that's what he did. And I consider that my dad died with dignity because he was able to choose his own path. Um, Yvette is, is lucky. She has good, although not excellent, health insurance. Um, but I've watched her fight with her insurance company for coverage of care. And she's still fighting for coverage to experimental drugs, access to clinical trials and payment from her insurance company for treatments recommended by her doctor. But still, her right is to seek all of those treatments and she'll do so until it's no longer uh, paying off for her. But at some point, both she and her physicians acknowledge that those options are gonna run out and so the second option that she has is to discontinue or refuse medical treatment at any time. So when a vet has had enough, she has the right to say to her doctors, I don't wanna receive any more treatment and anyone has that right at any point in New York and across the country. Um, even life-sustaining treatment at any point during, uh, during a medical uh, event, you can, you can refuse treatment. The third option, um, and this can be accessed by anyone at any time who's receiving care uh, for a terminal illness or for any illness, is to receive palliative care. Sometimes palliative care is referred to as comfort care. It's a specialized approach to the treatment of patients with a serious or life-threatening illness. And the goal of palliative care is to provide relief from symptoms, pain, and the stress of a serious illness. 
Palliative care can be provided alongside of curative treatment, but its goal is different. The goal is to provide management um, and not to extend, it's not about extending life, it's about, uh, it's, a, it's about providing management for the symptoms. It can involve alternative therapies, medications, massage, acupuncture, aromatherapy, spiritual health, anything that provides a person comfort. One palliative care option uh, that's available to those who may have a terminal prognosis, and one in many cases that is restricted to people who forego curative treatment, is called hospice care. Hospice is a specialized type of care for people facing a life-limiting illness. It involves a team of professionals working with the patient and the patient's family uh, to make sure that as the person um, enters that last stage that they're made as comfortable as possible. Um, one philosophy of hospice is that it's about the quality of life and not about the length of life. And Yvette is really lucky because there's a fantastic hospice in Buffalo and she's already in touch with those people. For some patients with certain kinds of diseases like cancer and the, uh, those who are receiving hospice and palliative care need to take additional steps to relieve prolonged suffering. And there are two additional options in New York State that they can avail themselves of. The first one is called voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And these, these two topics are going to be a little difficult to talk about, um, so just as a, as a little warning. V said, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is a conscious decision to refuse foods and fluids of any kind, including artificial nutrition, nutrition and hydration. This option can be chosen by a decisionally capable adult who has the ability to eat and drink but refuses so that they can advance the time of their death. It's a legal option anywhere in the United States. The US Supreme Court has affirmed that right. Um, VSED can be sought at home or in a care facility, but should be medically managed to uh, minimize discomfort. It's not an easy option. Stopping eating and drinking, it, uh, it's difficult for a family, it's difficult for the individual. Even though some who are dying, uh, I think is as you stated, it's normal. The loss of appetite and the desire to seek nutrition and hydration is, is normal, is a normal part of the dying process. Um, for some, discomfort from withholding food and, and drink uh, only lasts a day or two. For others, it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, I think, you know, we have a supporter in, in the Lower Hudson Valley who talks about her husband, Sid, who availed himself of VSED. And what she said is that it took him 12 days to die. Can you imagine not eating or drinking for 12 days just waiting to die? While the good people at hospice did all they could to keep him comfortable, Sid developed terminal agitation, which resulted in extreme verbal and physical outbursts, making his final days horrific and frightening. It was not peaceful. It was not the death that Sid wanted. And I think as a case like his illustrates, VSED isn't for everyone. Another option when standard hospice and palliative care aren't enough is the fifth and final option that I want to talk about, and that's palliative sedation. And sometimes it's called terminal sedation. It involves being medicated to reduce consciousness. It's an end-of-life option that's practiced in very rare circumstances. The prison remains unconscious until death, and at that time all nutrition and fluids are stopped. Sedation can bring relief for extreme pain and suffering, however, it may not totally relieve symptoms. Um, providers have described this option as something more akin to an art than a science. You give someone too much and you hasten death, which isn't allowed under the law. You give them too little and they regain consciousness and suffer. And that's what happened with uh, Jennifer Glass, who was a woman who spoke to the California legislature about her desire for medical aid in dying. Um, she wanted this option, and now her husband describes the death that she had, which was uh, quite traumatic for him as she woke up several times during this process. That's why, I think, in considering what those options are for people at the end, um, when those options aren't enough, that's why uh, we now have a, a move in this country to make available to everyone um, the option of medical aid and dying. And as you heard, it's a practice where a terminally ill and mentally capable adult can ask for medication that they can choose to hasten their own death. In the 20 years since Oregon first authorized medical aid and dying, there has not been a single incidence of abuse or coercion, and not one instance in any of the states that have authorized it since. 
The New York legislation has the same core protections as Oregon's law and every other state that has adopted uh, the practice since then. Um, I could go through the safeguards, but you heard them all. Uh, medical aid in dying is not for everyone. I think that is, is one of the pieces of the legislation that's the most important. If a doctor doesn't believe in it, if a patient doesn't believe in it, it doesn't have to be something that, that anyone faces. Um, it's all about uh, patient autonomy. Um, in fact, very few people actually ask for it in the states that authorize it, and fewer people actually use it in the end. So fully a third of the people in Oregon who've ever asked for, for, the, legis asked for the medication have used it. I think Governor Jerry Brown, a practicing Catholic and the governor of California, said it best when he signed that state's end-of-life option law into effect in 2015. He said, in the end, I was left to reflect on what I would want in the face of my own death. I, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill, and I wouldn't deny that right to others. I look forward to the day when our own governor signs aid and dying legislation, and I invite you to join me in that work. I know that this group is deciding whether or not to support allowing decisionally capable adults to choose medical aid and dying, and I hope that you do. But if you agree as an individual, I have petitions in the back that I hope that you'll sign to join us. So thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, our next speaker will be Aaron Beyer from Access to Independence uh, in Portland. Aaron. Thank you. <clears throat> Just struggling with my technology. <clears throat> my name is Aaron Beyer. I am the uh, Systems Advocacy and Architectural Barrier Programs Coordinator at Access to Independence. Uh, I am here to represent not only Access to Independence, but the independent living movement and uh, our collaboration and partnership with Not Dead Yet, another national organization. <clears throat> Access to Independence strives to empower people with disabilities to lead independent lives and strives to open doors to their full participation and access for all. <clears throat> access to Independence believes that people with disabilities have the right to control their own lives <clears throat> and participate fully in society. Um, while assisted suicide, physician assisted suicide, has the, may seem to offer independent choice. Um, there are instances where coercion and abuse can take place. However, those instances are not tracked or monitored. Um, and so it only seems as though those things never occur. Um, let me talk about a few points that we've seen uh, in states such as Oregon where not only the potential for abuse, but abuse has happened. <clears throat> First, there is a, a deadly mix between our broken, profit-driven healthcare system <coughs> and assisted suicide, <clears throat> where only, um, sorry, this topic gets a little tough for me. <clears throat> assisted suicide, is the cheapest so-called treatment. <clears throat> Will insurers do the right thing or the cheap thing? No direct coercion is necessary. An insurer need only deny or merely delay an expensive life-saving treatment and that would steer a person towards assisted suicide. This happened in Oregon where Two, two individuals were denied chemotherapy to treat their cancer. Instead, were offered a quote unquote free option for uh, ending their own lives. Second, elder <coughs> abuse and abuse of people with disabilities is on the rise. Um, if you speak to Office for the Aging, you, you know, you'll hear about this. An heir or an abusive caregiver could easily guide or steer a person towards the decision to end their own life. They could be the witness 
to the request for treatment. Um, while there is a protection for a secondary person, um, that secondary person may not know the entire situation. Um, that secondary witness could be a um, neutral bystander that doesn't understand the full scope of that person's disability, illness, or terminality. <clears throat> that caregiver or heir could be the person to pick up the drugs and even give those drugs because there is no requirement for a witness to be present at the death. And so who would know? Third, and this was mentioned already, that there's already an alternative and with palliative sedation. Um, this is a legal option. It may not always be perfect. However, it offers a legal solution and it does not endanger people with disabilities or chronically ill. Fourth, <clears throat> diagnosis of terminal illness is often wrong. A diagnosis of six months or a year could be true or it could be far off. People have lived far beyond the, the diagnosis of one to six, six months to a year uh, with cancer and with proper treatment. <clears throat> Home and community-based services offer um, options for prolonging life, prolonging life outside of assisted living <clears throat> facilities, and um, often provide a person with more independence and comfort in their last years. Doctor shopping. <clears throat> While any physician can say no, it does not stop a person from contacting Compassion and Choices or another supportive organization to find doctors that are assisted suicide friendly. By doing so, this circumvents and bypasses any safeguards that could be put in place. Sixth, people with psychiatric disabilities and mental illness are at particular risk with legalization of assisted suicide. <clears throat> Michael Freeland uh, was, a, is a, was a 64 year old man with a 43 year history of medic, medical history and depression and suicide attempts. Michael approached a physician about the option of assisted suicide. <clears throat> the, that physician stated that he didn't believe there was a need for a psychiatric consultation. Fortunately, Michael decided to get a second opinion and he pursued um, improved medical and suicide prevention services. By doing so, he was able to reconcile with his estranged daughter and <coughs> gain two years on his life before he passed away. Seventh, I mentioned data collection. Um, and that with current proposals in Washington and some of these other new proposals happening in other states, uh, data collection is woefully, um, it has no teeth. Uh, reporting requirements are lackluster, non-compliance um, is not monitored. There are few penalties, there's no way to enforce those penalties. and no established means. Um, my apologies. And no established means for finding out what exactly happened in cases of abuse. Underlying data, underlying data is, dis, is destroyed. Um, Oregon State has 
acknowledge that after the annual reports are published, um, all underlying data is destroyed. <clears throat> this leaves no opportunity for second parties to conduct research about assisted suicide and its impact on people. As was also mentioned, it is a detriment that the underlying terminal illness is what is required to be listed on the death certificate. Many physicians feel that this is a requirement for them to falsify that death certificate, and it makes accurate data collection impossible. <coughs> By legalizing assisted suicide, we are, in any shape or form, we are sending a message to our youth and our seniors that suicide is okay. We, you know, we, we look at our, our young people and we provide assisted suicide. Um, what are, you know, what are they going through? What are people going through when they suffer from chronic depression? They feel a burden. They feel as if there's no opportunity, no options left for them. So what do we do with them? We provide support. We provide hope. And while there may be instances where assisted suicide seems like the best and only option, I urge you to reconsider legalization because of the many other opportunities where coercion, abuse, and alternatives exist that could keep our loved ones alive and healthy and out of pain. Um, without dealing with the extremely dangerous precedent that we could set by legalizing assisted suicide. I would ask that the League of Women Voters, you know, not only maintain no position on this issue, but actually ask them to oppose this with us. Um, so I will end there, and I appreciate your time in hearing our position. Thank you very much, Alan. Deborah, would you like to provide general comments on the proposals or, or move to Q&A? Um, I, I guess I'd like to just respond. Might you pass the mic? Sure. sure. Sorry. I, um, I'm completely moved by what Aaron said and some things that, honestly, that I thought of that I'd like to see um, there be safeguards against. But what concerns me is that when families are left alone without their health care provider or their trusted health person to help them with decisions. Um, we know certainly that our elders are uh, account for about 12% of our population, but about 80% of our suicides. And that people are then left alone to make these decisions without the support of a health care provider and without the support and the ability to talk to a health care provider to sort out what is truly terminal illness and what is depression and what is re what is truly an end of life issue and what is a, um, a bump in the road. So I'm always concerned whenever we take away and, and we don't robustly support the ability to talk and give options. So I'm, I, I would love to see, you know, obviously the combination of them because um, we're all here for the same purpose and that's to support people so they get the best quality of, of what, they're, what they're seeking for. But I just, I just, I guess that, that, that's my huge take home point is that I never want anything to be taken away from the ability for people to talk to their people and have every option on the table for themselves. But I would love Q&A. Thank you all. Uh, now it's time for your questions. Uh, this is a difficult topic. Uh, I'll ask you to keep your personal remarks brief and, and pose questions and I will provide the mic to anyone who like to ask. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to address the use of the term uh, assisted suicide. I think it's rather disingenuous to try to paint it with a brush like that. We're here to have an open conversation about options and by continually referring to what is clearly not assisted suicide as such, you're trying to sway people with an emotional and a, an argument that I, I find distasteful. Along those lines, you mentioned a couple of times that there is no data, but at the same time you're contending that you're seeing instances, you're knowing this, there are abuses and things like that. Um, you can't have it both ways. There's either data that shows one or the other, but you can't have 
say that you know this is happening and then say there's no data to show it isn't. So I wanted to ask you, do you have information, data, uh, anecdotal, is there a place to find it that says where these abuses have taken place and such so we could educate ourselves? Yeah, thank you. Um, first, you know, there, there, are, there, are an, there is anecdotal data that exists. Um, however, there's not a lot of accurate <coughs> quantitative data uh, that exists. Um, if you want anecdotes, um, a great resource is notdeadyet.org. Um, <coughs> as far as you know, trying to sway or paint a picture. I think that both sides tend to do that, death with dignity versus assisted suicide, physician-assisted suicide. There, there are a number of ways to view this. Um, and I think one critical aspect that um, we try to point out is how this issue is portrayed in movies, in media. Um, take exam for example, the, the recent movie, Me Before You, um, where it is a person with a disability, not a person with a terminal illness who makes that choice. <clears throat> By making that choice, what's portrayed in that movie is that he is a noble and brave person for putting other people ahead of himself for ending his life before when he wants. And while it was his choice, we don't deny that. What we do just deny is the amounts of support that could have been offered to that individual. What we hope to see is that those choices are not made based on the burden that somebody feels, but rather on the love that they feel and the hope and the support that they feel. Can I, can I respond? Yes, please, other uh, comments. So a, a couple of things I wanna say on this topic of suicide. I think there is a big discussion uh, around these proposals of what terminology you use. Uh, people even organizing <coughs> forums like this across the state have struggled. Do I call it death with dignity? Do I call it assisted suicide? Some call it both. Some call it that, and medical aid in dying. Uh, but I think it's important to, to tease these apart, and I appreciate the question, because death with dignity does not mean medical aid in dying. Um, death with dignity actually means being able to die in the way that you choose. Um, assisted suicide is a tougher one, because if you look in the dictionary, uh, taking your own life is defined as suicide. But talk to anyone who is terminally ill and wanting this option, and they will tell you emphatically that they're not suicidal, uh, that they would much rather live than die, but that the disease is taking them. Um, so that's one way to look at it, but the other is to look at the leading uh, organization in this country that works to prevent suicide, the American Association of Suicidology, which uh, about two months ago came out with a statement about why medical aid and dying is distinct from suicide, and they gave 15 different reasons. Um, you can find that information on Compassion and Choices website, and I think it's a, it's a worthwhile read because it really digs into this term and why the two phenomena are different. Um, the last thing I want to say is that there, are, there have been anecdotes um, that we've heard here and from the debate across the country. Michael Freeland is one of them. There's a fact sheet on the back table called The Facts About Medical Aid and Dying, and at the end of that long fact sheet are um, several of the anecdotes that you might find uh, troubling that you might hear. Uh, we looked into each one of those as an organization, and, and the information is at the back. Can I say just one tiny more thing, and that is that I, I feel like we're facing a crisis in this country around healthcare. Um, and that we're all, I, I can't imagine that I'd talk to a single one of you individually that doesn't feel like we're at this point where we've got to fight together to preserve uh, the ability to get healthcare paid for. And my vision of the future of this movement is one where we're partners in that. I think that we share so many more values uh, than, we, than we disagree on. Um, and we're invested in the success of this law and then 
in when it's implemented, there being no abuse or coercion. And the, I think the one way that we can do that is to partner with the disability rights community. Um, so I, I just think we're better together than we are uh, apart on this issue. Deborah, any comment? Hi, um, I don't live in Portland, I'm from Ithaca, but I knew the League of Women <coughs> Voters, both here and in Ithaca, are considering this issue, and I wanted to come and share my own family's story about medical aid in dying. So my mother uh, lived in California, and she actually had been a supporter of medical aid in dying and the group Compassion and Choices and she was diagnosed with colon cancer that had already metastasized to her liver at the time of diagnosis. And um, she told each and every doctor that she was essentially forced to engage with because you know how it is. First of all, you have your internist and then there's the oncologist and the surgeon and the hospice care doctors, etc. That she wanted the choice to end her life on her own terms if this was a terminal disease, which it was. Um, so when the doctors, and it took two of them, of course, um, diagnosed her with less than six months to live, she did request the prescription, and she had it for two weeks. And then she told my sister and me and her husbands who were there with her that she was ready to take it. And I can tell you this is one of the things my sister and I would like to do is, is actually be able to talk to people whose families are considering this because it's pretty terrifying when you know, you've never seen this happen and you, you just don't know what it's going to be like. But I'll, I will tell you, first of all, I don't view my mother as committing suicide. She was having a great life. If she could have continued it, she certainly would have made that choice. But she was very much a realist and realized that death will come to every one of us, and she did not want to, um, you know, be at a point where she couldn't, uh, you know, take care of her own toileting needs, her um, be able to get up. I mean, she was at a point where it was very, very difficult for her to get out of bed and, and do much. And she took the prescription. My sister and I and our husbands were there. It was a very gentle, very peaceful death. It was certainly the kind of death I would wish for for anyone I cared about or even people I don't even know. So, I mean, that's my own experience with it and I wanted to show that with, with all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, any reaction from the panel? Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw another hand in the back. Thank you. Um, my name is Alex Alper. I'm from Cortland County Mental Health. I just had a question about the um, evaluation that would have to happen of, and, and what's the licensing or the other rules around that, because um, that's obviously a thing you want to make sure that the, that, that the professional is ready for that. Um, and on the other side, I'm the lead of our suicide prevention coalition here in, in town. Um, I would like to say that many people that are suicidal, they don't wish to die, they wish to not be in pain anymore, and so they sometimes make that choice. Um, but the important thing is that most people with mental health recover, about 90% of people, um, and only 20% of people with high blood pressure, need, like they need to stay on medication forever, and we are only 10%, so we're doing pretty good. Um, but yeah, but so big question is just what's the uh, things around the evaluation for mental health professionals? Um, so the law requires a doctor to make a determination. The, the treating physician has to make the determination about whether someone has the capacity to give informed consent. And that means understanding what the risks and benefits are of treatment and of foregoing treatment. And in this case, the benefits of taking the medication or not taking the medication. That is a determination that doctors are trained to do with every medical decision that we make. Um, when we go in for any kind of a procedure, the doctor has to determine that we have the ability to give informed consent for a medical procedure. So the same kind of uh, training and judgment from the physician is true of any end-of-life choice. 
So if someone wants to stop eating and drinking, if someone wants to forego treatment, if someone wants to undergo palliative sedation, all of these things are choices that people who are dying face. And doctors have to determine whether someone has the capacity to make the decision. Um, so think about the palliative sedation decision. Um, if someone uh, decided that they, that they wanted to hasten death, uh, they could, that could be the result of depression, or it could be the result of wanting to avoid unnecessary suffering uh, you know, at, at, at a time when, when you're dying. The doctor has to determine whether that uh, decision is being made uh, freely, without coercion, and um, you know, with, a, with a fully informed uh, understanding of all the options. If either doctor, the treating doctor or the consulting doctor, have any doubts about whether someone has that capacity, they then have to refer that person to a licensed mental health provider. And in New York State, a psychologist, a psychiatrist um, has to make that decision. And the prescription can't be given until that doctor gives the okay. So that's what the law would provide. And, and if I may add, I did print the proposed legislation in New York State. There is a definition in it of mental health professional, and as with other legislation, it's really important that experts in our communities review that kind of language. Uh, it means a physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or psychologist licensed or certified under the education law acting within his or her scope of practice and it was qualified by training and experience, certification or board certification or eligibility to make a determination under section X of the proposed law. Any other comments? Thank you, Alex. Um, I also, you know, I just want to make one more point. Um, in the distinguishing between death with dignity and assisted suicide, as, as we like to call it. Um, we are not having, you know, really we are not having a conversation about death with dignity and options. There are legal options. Uh, what we're really, we are really concerned with is adding that option for an insurance company to provide and pay for a lethal dose of medication to allow a person to end their own life. That is the specific issue we are discussing. <clears throat> so, you know, you mention a physician and a consulting physician could potentially say no, but, and that that person would then have to go to mental health treatment or at least for a consultation. <clears throat> What's stopping that individual from seeking out a doctor or a physician who would just say yes? What, what safeguards are there to keep a person from doing that? Or to ensure that that person is receiving, not just trying to bypass or circumvent those safeguards? Should I, should I answer? Certainly. Um, so, I'm trying to think of the name of the office of the federal government that was just established that allows providers to refuse to treat people because of their religious beliefs um, or, frankly, any other grounds of discrimination. Um, the office of, I can't remember what it's called, it was just established two or three days ago. Um, we, unfortunately, are in a situation in our country where many of us have to doctor shop. That phrase sounds terrible, it sounds scary, it sounds awful, but oftentimes we have to find providers that are willing to provide us with the care that we want. We have to shop for providers that are willing to provide the aggressive treatment that we want. People with disabilities have to, provide, have to shop for doctors who understand how to provide basic care for people living with disabilities. Um, I think it's no different for end-of-life options, particularly in the early days of a law. Um, there are going to be some doctors who feel very uncomfortable with this issue, and we've seen that in Oregon, in Washington, and even in California. But in, an increasing number of doctors and state medical societies are understanding that this option is benefiting a small number of patients, but many, many more who ask the questions and have the conversations are experiencing improved end-of-life care. And so you may have to look around. In, in a state that has just adopted an, an end-of-life 
bill for a doctor that, that is willing to provide this care. But remember, you still need two doctors to certify that you're terminally ill, that you're within six months of death. And by the way, um, most doctors are wrong about prognosis. 85% of doctors are wrong. But they, they overestimate how long you have to live. If you look at the research, the vast majority of uh, mis misprognoses are in estimating that someone has longer to live than they do. Certainly, there are people who live and outlive their prognoses. I'm Catholic, I call those miracles. I'm grateful for them. Um, but the vast majority of people die way before. My own dad got into hospice uh, two days before he died because the doctor didn't want to give up. My family didn't want to give up. No one wanted to face that someone had a six-month prognosis. So I think those things are important to keep in mind. Uh, that, that's, that term is scary, doctor shopping, um, but we're all gonna be having to do a lot more of it under this, uh, under this environment. Are there other comments, sir? I just am sitting here wondering in my own mind from my experiences, I work with people with Alzheimer's and uh, at the end of life, they are not able to be articulate to express mental capacity in the traditional ways that we assess it. But that's true with people who are diagnosed with what we used to call mental retardation or intellectual cognitive impairment kind of thing. So it's an iffy business, this thing about physicians being able to judge mental capacity for a person who has these limitations that have not been, have not come up sufficiently through the medical curricula at the colleges and universities so that we've made a lot of mistakes in saying, well, Michael really doesn't understand what you're saying. We now have evidence that Michael does understand but has not, does not have the capacity to articulate where that business is to, to say that kind of thing. I, it's just adds more of a quandary. It's not a statement of don't, yes, but it's a question of holy mackerel, have that burden put upon one to make that decision with the limited knowledge we have, really tricky business. Yeah, yeah I, I think we've seen that time and time again. I've been in healthcare for almost 40 years now, and, and things that we used to think were, you know, hands down in HIV. I mean, we used to think that that was a death sentence, and now it's a chronic illness. I mean, we've seen so much change, and, and I trust that we're going to see so much more change after I'm gone as well, that we can only make decisions based on the knowledge that we currently have, of course, um, and, and then use the best science that we have, and be cautious about using casual science or anecdotes if we can, and, and use the real thing. Um, I think it, it comes down to consumers, um, and organizations like the League of Women Voters going out and bringing in people with a lot of different ideas together to talk about this. Because, I mean, as we pointed out, we, we all have, have to some degree a little bit different twist on this, but we all ultimately care that the right thing happens to our fellow human beings every single day that they have on this planet. And we need to keep talking about that and keep adjusting that as our knowledge about our, our lives, ourselves, and medicine changes. Um, we can never stop because we think we know it all at any point, because we only know what we don't. So, I agree. Any other responses to that? Other questions or comments? Is there anyone who hasn't spoken up yet? Would like to? I'm, I'm gonna uh, just no. say one Aaron. more thing. Aaron? You know, um, this gentleman raises a good point. There's, there's a lot of ifs, and there's a lot of we don't know. Uh, when it comes to mental capacity for um, th this level of a decision, um, and then there's a lot of ifs and unknowns as to what drives those decisions. Um, I'm gonna tell a little bit of a, a story because <clears throat> this is something that's personal to me. Um, and many of you didn't see me walk in here. I'm a person who is uh, considered legally blind. I have a degenerative disability. It's gonna get worse as I get older. I rely on you know, public transportation. I've had to rely on government assistance in my life. Um, and when I entered the workforce, it was through supported employment, sheltered workshops, 
And this is the, the path that many people with developmental disabilities go through. The air in those workshops, for me, was hopeless. And the, the motive was people don't want to hire you, people aren't going to hire you, you're going to be stuck here the rest of your life. And I would be lying if I didn't tell you that that air made me feel useless. <clears throat> so much to the point that I considered suicide. And, and I say suicide not as an aid in dying, but literally I was depressed. And if it wasn't for those supports outside of that place that helped me, if it wasn't for the, my friends in college, my professors, my family, that got me through that point in my life, you know, I, it could have it could have been over. And so, the if I want to raise is if you're aged, if you're at that point where you can make a conscious decision, what is driving that decision? Is it the fact that you're in pain and you want to die? Or is it the fact that you maybe want to not be a burden on your family? You feel as though you're a drain on the government. You feel as though you're a drain on your caregivers and on your family, and it's causing these problems. That's a big if. And it's, it is anecdotal, but if, you know, if one person dies wrongfully because of this law, is it worth it? Thank you. <clears throat> I found this very interesting today. Um, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. One was number um, the, the presentation that you gave, two of your five examples, I felt one was a failure of pain control, the second one was a failure of the mental health issues. Um, and those are things I think we really have to watch. The other thing I'm really concerned about is the nose, camel's nose under the edge of the tent. How far can this go? Will we suddenly be stuck with only one answer that you think you have to do or that the insurance company makes for you if they stop your medical care because you're too expensive. That kind of thing worries me when you involve the government in these issues. And I don't care if it's New York State or the federal government or what. And I know this from my personal anecdote Back in the late 30s, I had a relative in Germany. She had schizophrenia, and they took her out and shot her. Yeah, she was a drain. Why would she live? And my third point, I am Catholic. Who are we to say, I'm God, I decide when I go? Myself, and I'm standing here reasonably healthy. <laughs> So maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But the day I go, I want to thank God is there saying, come on in. Not saying, we don't even know why you're here. Thank you. Uh, responses from the panel? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for, for bringing those things up. I, I'm Catholic too. Uh, and I had to get my mother's blessing before I took this job. My whole family's Catholic, and one of the one of the things I said to her is, um, you know, even though my family wouldn't choose medical aid and dying, we do believe in freedom of religion and not standing in other people's way. Um, you know, it, it's not Governor Cuomo or the state of New York that tells me not to eat meat on Fridays during Lent. It's my religion. Um, so I, I think that we should all be able to die on our own terms according to our own values. I would say that you said that the two of the anecdotes were about um, mental health and about failure of pain control. The first anecdote that I gave you, he was in a premier medical institution in the middle of Manhattan um, being treated by a competent palliative care team and they acknowledged that there's a limit 
to the kind of pain control that they can provide. And, and that's why 10 medical societies have now come on board and said there needs to be another option because um, there are limits to what uh, palliative medicine can do to relieve suffering. Um, and as far as the failure of mental health with the 9-11 first responder, uh, you know, one of the things he told his best friend before he did this is he didn't want anyone to think that he was crazy. Um, you know, it was really important for him to, because there was no legal option in New York, important for him to make sure that the people around him knew that he wasn't suffering from a mental disorder, that he really was just done um, because he was dying and it was getting worse and there was no other option. Um, there was one other thing that you said that I wanted to, to get to, and that was, oh, the nose under the camel's, camel's tent. You know, Oregon's law has been in place since 1994, and there hasn't been a single move to expand it beyond uh, patient autonomy. So there are a number of people who say, as this gentleman did, that, um, you know, folks have varying decisional capacity, and people with uh, mental health disorders or people who have limited cognitive abilities may, may be able to express their wishes. Um, no one has wanted to tinker with Oregon's law to expand it to people who have, for example, Alzheimer's or dementia and might be able to make the decision today and put it in their living will. No, those, those moves are not for these laws in, in this country. There are laws in other countries that are more expansive, but in this country, Oregon's law has actually worked. And it's limited to people who can make the decision from the time of the request to the time that they ingest the medication. And that has never changed in the two decades now that Oregon's law has been in place. And no other law that's been introduced has varied from those uh, very strict safeguards. So. There's uh, maybe a couple more comments and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I think it's, uh, we haven't mentioned quality of life very often here. And I think we need to talk about choice and informed consent and uh, um, that needs to be right foremost in our mind. And I, I just think of Scott Nearing's death where he chose me, <coughs> he was 103, he couldn't work in his garden anymore. His quality of life was not what he wanted. He didn't see any future. If he couldn't do what he wanted to do, so he chose not to eat. And ended his, so ended his life. So again, it's, it really is, we're talking quality of life and choices. I agree, and I think that we shouldn't push our quality onto somebody else's quality. We need to choose our quality for ourselves. And we need to have things set up so we all have that many options instead of me making a judgment about what a quality is for someone else, just like a religious preference or just like any preference, because my job really as a nurse is to support the person in front of me's preference um, without regard to my preference. And if I do feel regard to my preference, then I need to excuse myself from that situation. So um, the most important thing is that we support the person in front of us and let them have all those options, I agree. Yeah. Thank you, and you know, quality of life is extremely important to the independent living philosophy. Um, we provide a variety of environmental modifications, ramps, expanded bathrooms, assistive technology to improve um, the capability of a person to live in their own home. Um, the ADA is there to protect people with disabilities. Um, and to ensure that they have a positive quality of life, but that also goes into their ability to access community activities, do the things that they want to do. And if a person feels as though their quality of life is diminished and they are in the end stages of life, they already have legal options and legal alternatives to medical aid in dying or assisted suicide lethal doses of medication. Um, they have options. They have legal alternatives. They have things that they can do um, to take it to that stage of, if they, feel, if they feel as though they want to take it to that stage. We don't need a law for assisted suicide in New York State, which would only open up the doors and endanger people if it goes through. It's not that it, 
has been proven to endanger people or has not been proven to endanger people, the fact remains that the possibility for it to endanger people exists, and we cannot stand for that. One last question. I've been a hospice volunteer and a spiritual care volunteer. So I've been around death, and I'm sure all of you have been around it. For the experiences I've had, it's a peaceful thing. I've never had anybody say, I wish I could die. Um, it's, it's a lot different than what you might think it is. And I've seen people in pain. I've seen people without pain that knew they were going to die. And to me, it's, it's a very moving spiritual thing for me to do it. But the other part of your question is, some of you are Catholic, I'm Lutheran. We don't believe in abortion, right? Not a woman's right or a person's right to kill a child. Why is it that we think it should be our right to let somebody kill themselves? Response from the panel. <clears throat> I would say that there's a difference between believing something for yourself and standing in the way of what others believe. As, as, as a person of faith, one might feel that abortion is, is not a choice that they should make, that that's something that their religion, that their beliefs, that their values tells them, but it, other people feel that it would be equally wrong to stand in someone else's way to exercise their own values. Um, so getting back to the, the concept of, of, uh, of what we're talking about today though, what we know uh, from the Orion experience is that this has not been abused. Um, and what we know is that this has given people opportunities to speak with their health care provider and have the opportunity to at least explore so they have control over all those options. And a huge part of feeling satisfied and having quality of life is feeling like you have control and you have control of your options. And having the ability to talk to somebody who has the ability and time to sit with you and, and talk about this, which is your trusted healthcare person, whether it's your doctor, your nurse practitioner, whoever it is. And I, I feel in my heart that this law will follow along with what Oregon's doing and give us that opportunity. It's, it's not anything that we have to do. If it's something you don't believe in, you don't do it. If it's something you believe in, you'll have that option. You'll have another tool in your toolbox if this is the right tool for you to use. I, I wouldn't want to force anything on anybody and when we talk about doctor shop I certainly know plenty of doctors I mean I think to some degree I've seen plenty of people who doctor shop um, who want um, even things as basic as how somebody who chooses somebody for functional medicine or for internal medicine and people seek out that provider that they have a bond with and they have a, a, a mutual feeling of, of that's where their philosophy of life is and I just want everybody to have that option to seek out that ability to have their philosophy of life heard and understood and to seek that care. I just want to take a minute to thank uh, the panel and uh, the information along with uh, Allison here inviting and coming to the uh, community center and thanking the League of Women Voters. They do a wonderful job for our city and county. And I want to thank you all for coming and uh, questions Great, answers great. It's something for us all to think about. I wanted to put up the uh, last slide here, which encourages people to join the League of Women Voters of Portland County. Also, for those of you who are League members, uh, there are several ways you can vote. Uh, we'd love to have you at our February 5th board meeting to participate in a discussion. But if you're not able to attend or prefer not to, uh, you can turn in your vote today. So basically, I support the concurrence position or I oppose the concurrence position. Print your name, sign your name, date the paper. You can also, if you want to think about it, we scheduled this so there's time for us to all go home and digest this. 
Uh, if you want to think about it, you can scan the form and email it, or you can mail it to our PO box, 22 in Portland. Um, we just ask that you make sure they arrive by the Friday before our board meeting. Uh, so that'd be Friday, February 2nd. Uh, I want to encourage you all to pick up one of those pink forms on your way out. Uh, I know from my own family uh, history, my father was a surgeon who developed ALS. He chose to go on a ventilator. He became quadriplegic, so he lived for many years as a quadriplegic, uh, writing with a tongue switch, publishing using a tongue switch. So his initial choices were to value, to choose artificial nutrition, to choose artificial respiration. Much later in the process, when many of his functions were shutting down, he chose to put a do not resuscitate order in place. So keep in mind as you look at that form that your wishes, your wishes, may change over time and you can update your living will, you can update your, your most order and it's important to keep the discussion going with, with the people that, that you love as well as your medical professionals. So thank you so much, all of you, for coming today. Thank you.